Let's now review some surface anatomy that's relative to the heart. The heart lies in the mediastinum, deep to the sternum. It also lies to the left of the midsternal line and approximately the third to the sixth costal cartilages. The base of the heart is just inferior to the sternal angle. The apex of the heart, or the tip of the left ventricle, lies at or just medial to the midclavicular line at the fourth or fifth intercostal space. The precordium is the area of the chest wall that overlies the anterior surface of the heart. The heart is divided into right and left sides, but it, the heart is vertically rotated so that the right ventricle is mostly the anterior precordium. In fact, most of the precordium is made up of the right ventricle. The right atrium is at the superior border of the right side of the precordium, and the left ventricle represents a small area at the left side of the precordium. The left atrium does not have a projection on the precordium, and in fact lies posteriorly in the mediastinum. To position the patient for the heart exam, according to the Loyola 65 steps, the table should be flat. According to the Bates textbook, the table should be elevated to 30 degrees. Either way is fine. But the examination should always be done in skin and not over a gown or an article of clothing. And of course, the doctor should always be on the patient's right side, and the room needs to be quiet. As with any examination, we first begin by inspecting the precordium. We look for any lifts or heaves that might occur in the parasternal area. We also try to see if we can identify the point of maximal impulse just by inspection. In some patients, we can do that. Also, after we've finished inspecting with the patient's supine, sometimes it helps to find the PMI by having the patient roll 45 degrees to the left side. And at that point, sometimes it's easier to identify the point of maximal impulse right there. Okay, you can lay flat again, Dad. If rolling over on the side isn't enough to bring the PMI uh, out, then you can also ask the patient to exhale fully and hold their breath for a few seconds while you look for the PMI. The second part of the examination is palpation. For palpation, it's recommended you use the base of the fingers or the metacarpal phalangeal joints for palpation. And there's five different locations that you need to palpate. You palpate in the aortic area or the right second intercostal space next in the left second intercostal space or the pulmonic area, then in the left parasternal area, then towards the apex of the heart or where the PMI is in the fourth or fifth intercostal space in the midclavicular line, and finally in the epigastrium. When you're palpating, you're trying to identify if there's any uh, lifts against your uh, hand of the heart as it contracts. The PMI will feel like a gentle tap or brief thrust against your hand. Some texts advocate using the finger pads to feel in the left parasternal area. Once you identify the PMI with the uh, metacarpal phalangeal joints, you further identify it by using just your finger uh, pads. The PMI can be characterized by diameter, duration and amplitude. Normally the diameter is less than 2.5 centimeters or one intercostal space. If you have to lay two or three fingers next to each other to feel the entire PMI, then the PMI diameter is enlarged. Also, feel for the duration of the PMI. And you need to listen or auscultate to the heart while doing this. Normally the sense of uh, maximal impulse lasts for less than two-thirds of systole. If the impulse continues all the way through systole to S2, the patient could have ventricular hypertrophy from chronic hypertension. And finally, feel for the amplitude of the PMI. Again, it should just be a gentle tap against your finger pads. If the amplitude feels very light, the heart is probably contracting less vigorously as happens with a dilated cardiomyopathy. If the amplitude is increased or vigorous, that can sometimes be seen in high cardiac output states such as severe anemia or hyperthyroidism. Again, if you can't f feel the PMI with the patient's supine, again, if you could roll over to your left side about 45 degrees, 
and exhale fully. Again, this makes it more obvious, the, the PMI, by this maneuver. Okay, you can lay back. Sometimes the patient has a very muscular chest wall or a patient who's very obese or a patient has a very increased AP diameter of the chest, as happens with emphysema, uh, the PMI cannot be palpated. If you can't palpate the PMI, another way to identify the left heart border is by percussion. Um, and this is a step that's not normally done, but with the patient's supine and approximately the fourth interspace, begin percussing from about the anterior axillary line and move medially till you hear the resonance of the lung change to dullness. Do you notice the change at that point? Let me do that again. That dullness would be where the left heart border is at. And again, if you don't hear that in the fourth uh, intercostal space, you can go down to the fifth or above in the third intercostal space to percuss for the left heart border. You remember that the normal heart sounds arise as the heart valves close. S1, or the first heart sound, represents the closure of the mitral valve and the tricuspid valve. S2, or the second heart sound, represents the closure of the aortic valve and the pulmonic valve. The first and second heart sounds define systole and diastole, with systole being the time between S1 and S2. As a general principle, right-sided valve closures occur slightly later or after left-sided valve closures. For example, the aortic valve usually closes first, then the pulmonic valve closes, especially accentuated during deep inspiration. Also, as a general rule, left-sided valve closings are louder than the right valve closing sounds. You normally cannot hear the pulmonic valve close in any location except in the left second intercostal space. The best place to identify the tricuspid valve is along the left lower sternal border. The best and loudest place to hear the mitral valve is at the apex of the heart. The next step of the heart exam is auscultation. Again, when you auscultate, it should be done on skin with the room quiet. And you need to listen again in five locations, the same five locations that you palpated. Again, first we're going to listen with the diaphragm of the stethoscope. And it doesn't matter what exact order you auscultate those five locations, as long as you're systematic and do it the same way consistently. I'm going to identify the angle of Louis and first listen in the right second intercostal space or the aortic area with the diaphragm. Then the left second intercostal space. left lower sternal border. Then at the point of maximal impulse, or the apex. and then in the epigastrium. And I'm going to repeat all of those by listening with the bell of my stethoscope. Notice with the bell, the stethoscope just gently rests on the skin. No pressure needs to be applied. And take your time when you're auscultating. You'll know that there are specific sounds that are heard loudest at certain locations. Again, S1 is loudest at the apex, and S2 is loudest at the base of the heart. Take time to listen in each area and concentrate your attention and focus on the things that you know belong in that area of the heart. And remember to listen in all five areas with both sides of your stethoscope. 
sometimes you need to do extra maneuvers or positions to bring the heart closer to the chest wall. You may ask the patient to roll on their left side. In fact, you could roll over on the left, about 45 degrees. Exhale completely. Again, this maneuver brings the heart closer to the chest wall and aids in auscultation. Okay, you can breathe. Another maneuver would have the patient sit up, lean forward, and exhale, and hold their breath. That would help the examiner hear the murmur of aortic regurgitation better. Also, palpate in the suprasternal notch with your index finger by pressing posteriorly and somewhat inferiorly. You want to check for any abnormal pulsations or thrills that might come with an aortic aneurysm or a loud aortic stenosis murmur. In conclusion, I hope this video has been helpful in introducing you to the steps that are necessary to assess blood pressure, neck veins, and the cardiac examination. Of course, the only way you become good at this is by practice. Good luck. Mm -hmm.